Hello and welcome to North Country Matters. My name is Donna Seymour. I'm a member of the League of Women Voters of St. Lawrence County, one of the civic partners for our show. Today we have Kevin Akers, the incumbent candidate for St. Lawrence County Legislature District 8 with us in the studio. Here as well is Betty Connolly, also from the League of Women Voters, to help with our questions. And let me just take a second here to set what conversations with candidates are. They're designed to provide voter education that thoughtfully and civilly discusses the issues of public policy and governance vital to our community. They're nonpartisan conversations. We invite the candidate to explain his or her positions, records, and ideas away from the 30-second campaign ad and the discussion constraints of a debate format. An invitation was extended to each candidate for this office, and we will host the other candidate in this race a little later in the series. Uh, so, welcome Kevin. Kevin is the incumbent for District 8. He's also the chair of the St. Louis County Board of Legislators. So, um, we, have, uh, uh, we have a leader, leader here today as well. And I want to take just a minute to um, show our viewers a map of District 8. It takes in the towns of Canton and Potsdam and the town of Madrid. And like lots of uh, districts, it looks pretty odd. It does. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kevin, uh, we're going to have Betty get started with you. Okay. Our so, Kevin, as uh, Donna had mentioned, um, you're running for a third term on the county board, and you're currently serving as the board chairman. So, can you tell us what inspired you to run for the uh, legislature in the first place? First place? Well, I had done 22 years on the Madrid Waterton School Board and six years on the BOCES Board. So my final term ended in 2007. Mm -hmm. And so I actually was looking forward to not having a meeting for <laughs> since the age of 27. Um, How'd that work out? <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a brief delay. Uh, then the Republican chairman at the time, uh, Nancy Martin, called me. And that was about January 2009, and asking me to run to, to consider it. And uh, I said, just like I told you, I said, well, I was kind of looking forward to not having a meeting. And, uh, well, we want you to think about it. You know, we think you're a viable candidate, and you have a history of problem solving, and would you consider it? And I said, well, uh, maybe at some time later. Well, she goes, if you don't mind, I'm going to keep calling it. I said, well, that's fine, Nancy. She's a neighbor of mine. And that's what she did. And so after uh, 11 months of uh, consideration, um, I decided to run. So. Good. Well, can you tell us a little bit, what's the, what's the difference between the role of a legislator and the role of the, the chairperson that you, the seat you sit on? Well, they're one and the same, but it, as the chairman, you represent the majority. And whatever the vote is decided, it could be a contentious uh, issue, and it may be an issue that I don't support, that I may have actually voted against. But if it's the will of, board, of the board, it's, it's my job uh, to represent them. Also, there's a lot of interpersonal reaction with the county administrator and the county attorney, uh, other elected officials, uh, whether it's the congresswoman, um, state representatives, uh, Senator Ritchie and, and uh, Addie Jenny. Um, it's a pretty intense role. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a lot more meetings than you probably thought you were going to be getting into at the beginning of this process, right? Yes, the school board is maybe once or twice a month, and yeah. so this is uh, every Monday, and then you have your other uh, committee meetings and mm -hmm. your assignments to go along with it. Mm -hmm. So, so it can be a really full-time job. But it, but it's a, it's supposed to be part-time, and the pay is part-time, but yes. your, your efforts are... Uh, much more uh, frequent than that, isn't it? Not right. just for me, but for for all the legislators, right. for sure. Good. Yeah. So, Kevin, we'd like you to give us your kind of top three critical issues that you see for the county that the board will be dealing with, and um, you know, make it. You don't have to go into a lot of detail right now because we'll follow up with you more on that. But what do you think are the top issues that that the board needs to address in the coming months? Well, the two that are most prevalent is, is number one is our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So we have about 200 bridges and about 600 miles of road, and the state has deemed them to be about 40% deficient. So our county highway superintendent says that in order to maintain the 40% deficiency, we're going to have to have tw uh, about $10 million a year. But we don't have $10 million a year. So we have a list of bridges, and they're in an order that the ones that are most needed to be uh, repaired. So we need to find a way to leverage our local, state, and federal uh, dollars. And hopefully we'll have some more money that's coming from the federal level. But those are also 
administer it through Albany. So the problem is for Albany is much of those infrastructure dollars are going towards New York City, the tunnel and whatnot. So I'm not sure that we are actually getting our fair share. And I think uh, that what we'll be doing more so in the future is lobbying our state representatives mm -hmm. to get a, more, a, big, a larger piece of that. Since we have such a small population and the infrastructure that we have is large uh, to get around and we have, you know, we're blessed with many rivers and streams, but they all have to be crossed for commerce. Right, and of course, one of the problems um, is that uh, where population is dense, it's much easier to do infrastructure because you know a lot of people are using it. Up here, uh, where we have more trees and cows than people, that is not always the case, is it? Yeah, it takes about, if you're building a new road, it takes about a million dollars per mile. And just to resurface it is about a little bit over $110,000, $120,000. And that's for towns also, it's not just the counties. The second thing is we have a problem with addiction. Uh, interesting enough in my research that actually uh, alcoholism is higher than opioids. And so that is our, actually our most prevalent problem. Uh, the state or the county board of health has actually made it their number one priority uh, to put forth an opioid task force and to come to the legislative body and present those ideas. Uh, last year I think we lost about nine people for an opioid and heroin addiction and I think the year before 16 so uh, it's kind of distressing uh, you know when I grew up in the 70s you never heard of about heroin being used in the North Country uh, and it really boggles my mind that people are trying it you know young people uh, you know with not thinking about the dangers of it mm -hmm. do you um, can you expand a little bit on that I'd like to uh, talk about uh, that Canada now has, we're all aware, uh, marijuana is, uh, is, is is legal there. Do you think that's going to have a spillover into our county? Well, I think already, you know, if you've got uh, you've got roundtables going around in New York State where the state is actually asking for feedback. It's been in the media about uh, decriminalization of marijuana and Vermont is going legal. Um, it'll be a really kind of a mixed bag with Vermont being legal and actually with Canada being legal as far as the law enforcement and where they lay. Um, you know, I think we've had a number of states here, uh, Colorado and others that have legalized uh, against federal law marijuana. And I'd like to see uh, what the health impacts are, are. I know like in Colorado, they're having a hard time finding truck drivers, somebody that can pass a drug test or even butchers uh, because they can't pass that test. So, uh, you know, they may, the states may be reaping the awards of, uh, from the taxation of the marijuana, but how much marijuana is actually coming in that, or being grown, that's not taxed. So I think it has uh, a lot of uh, drawbacks to it. Uh, I actually am in favor of decriminalization. I'm not sure about the legalization. Uh, I think for nonviolent uh, offenders uh, and putting them in prison for marijuana offenses is really... Uh, you're putting somebody who's nonviolent that uh, you know it's not doing him any, any good to be in prison. Well, you mentioned public health concerns, Kevin, and that really is a big issue um, in this county. It's a big issue all over the country, really. So you know, you, you mentioned a little bit about um, uh, about the opioid crisis, which really is more of a crisis of middle-aged people than it is young people, yeah. because. Uh, a lot of them take those, uh, they've been prescribed them by doctors for pain or for um, other kinds of, of things like that that may actually be work related in terms of injuries. But when you look at some of the issues that people, you mentioned <coughs> alcoholism, we know smoking has a negative effect on health, lack of exercise, poor diet, all those, those kinds of things. Many of those are the result of lifestyle choices. That makes it tough, doesn't it, for the legislature and yeah. the county board of health to figure out how to address those issues? It does. St. Lawrence County is one of the highest counties for um, lung disease and uh, diabetes and heart problems. And it's largely because, I mean, those types of things are related to poverty levels, mm -hmm. and particularly with smoking. If you look at the individuals who are dying of cancer from smoking, uh, many of them are you know at the at the poverty level so in a county like ours those that's why the rates are higher it's I don't think it's a lack of education uh, from from the part of the, the schools and the advertising I mean I think it says on the pack that smoke these these will kill you practically 
Um, so it's it's personal choice. On the opioid thing, um, we are in a lawsuit against uh, major pharmaceutical firms. Uh, and there's an example of where I actually voted against it. And the reason I voted against it um, was because that I felt that the drugs that were being produced are actually legal. What they have produced is legal. It's not the pharmaceutical firm that, uh, that it's manu they're, they're manufacturing, but it's not them that are prescribing it. And I find it hard to believe that today with all the information that's out there, that doctors continue to prescribe excessive amounts of opioids, Oxycontin, Percocet. Um, you go in for a simple uh, minor surgery uh, and they may prescribe 30 pills and, uh, and then actually a refill when uh, Tylenol works fine. Mm -hmm. So um, the doctors have a hand in this responsibility, but I was in the minority, but I'm the county chair, that was the will of the board, and we are in this lawsuit, along with many other counties, but there's an Thank example, you. Betty. Okay, it is, it is a complex issue. Thank you. Yeah. Kevin, uh, the board got some good news recently from the comptroller's office that the county is no longer on the list of physically stressed counties, and that the county tax rate is scheduled to go down. Uh, for the second year. Can you tell us how that happened? Well, it's because of our leadership, and I'll have to claim it's the Republican leadership. Um, back in 2015, we were in the hole about $3 million, and we were borrowing up to, and I think in 2011, we borrowed $12 million for cash flow. And then it was 10, and it was 9, and that was our number of Republican goal, was to actually get that number down. Um, so how it's happened is uh, that we basically have set the policies and provided the county administrator with the guidelines. We didn't want to exceed the tax cap. Uh, we didn't want to continue to borrow this, and we wanted to replenish the savings. Um, so a large part of that was our county administrator, Ruth Doyle, going to the department heads and saying, we have limited amount of money, and we need to pull this in and find efficiencies and uh, reduce duplications and things of that nature. And she's done a wonderful job. And the beauty of it is, it's been reported that, uh, and it's true, that there's been 150 jobs, but the 100 lost. But the 150 jobs are actually from 2011. From 2015, when the Republicans took over, until now, there's 28 jobs. And so we're actually adding 5.8, so we're actually adding six people this year. Mm -hmm. So it hasn't been truly, uh, as it's been reported, that it's been primarily on the backs of the individuals of the employees. They've all been through attrition, retirements, and actually some consolidation and some promotions. Uh, so the, I have to give the credit to the department heads. They've been very innovative. And our largest department is social services. We have 220 some employees in there, and it's about a $60 million budget. And so Chris Radiz, he's a wonderful man, uh, that the poor here in this county are lucky to have Chris Radiz uh, as, as an advocate. He does a tremendous job. Uh, but he's been able to find savings. And so in the largest department, 60 million, that's where you're going to get the savings. And the beauty of it is we've done all this without reducing any services. Um, could we uh, talk a little bit about the sales tax? Sure. Um, that the board has uh, raised the county sales tax from 3% to 4%. And we've talked about the widespread poverty in the county. And this appears to really hit the poorest uh, residents hard. Um, can you tell me, uh, perhaps is there another way that uh, the board would look at raising okay. revenue? Well, I think that took place, what, in 2013. So, and if you look back at the records, I was the last one to support that. Uh, and. The big argument was, and well, for me, it was it's a regressive tax, and it's just the argument you proposed. Uh, but the counter argument that the other legislators uh, did, and it was a Democrat majority, was that we needed the revenue, and this actually was more fair. They felt because it hit everyone, not just the actual property tax um, owners and stuff like that. So, the revenue is up from the sales tax, um, largely because of the tax cuts that had been implemented but also because uh, the price of gas is up. So with the price of gas, there's higher sales tax. Mm -hmm. So but it's a better feeling amongst in the economy. Uh, we're experiencing some, some growth. Uh, wages are going up, contrary to the popular myth. They are going up. Um, if you look around your retail sectors, there's signs everywhere looking for help. 
Um, so it's a, it's a turnaround. I think you go back to 2008 with the recession carried over to 2009 and 10, and St. Lawrence County, uh, we lost a lot of jobs in Messina uh, with GM, Reynolds, and uh, the shrinking of Alcoa. So that had a major impact on our, our revenues. So, you know, that's something that you can't bank on. I think we're budgeting for $58 million coming in. And of that $58 million, we split half of that with the towns. The, of the, one, the additional 1% that the uh, local law was passed, that is not shared 50-50. So I think the towns get 10% of that. And because of previous agreement, the city of Augensburg, I think, gets 6.7. So, and if you look, if you compare it to counties around the state, actually St. Lawrence County is one of the few counties that actually splits that at sales tax 50-50. Many counties just take it. So uh, there's like five or six of us, I think, that are 50-50. And I'm not advocating for a change of that. I mean, because I believe it's the same wallet. So if we, if we take that sales tax away from our towns or villages, uh, they're going to have to pay, which is it's really not, it's the same wallet. So. You know, just one more question on, sure. on taxes. Uh, New York State waived the sales tax on home heating right. fuel, um, and the uh, the county charges four percent. Right. Do you see? Do you feel that's necessary? Do you see any change coming in the future? Or what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's something worth discussing. Mm -hmm. You know, because it is a it's a heavy tax, I believe, and it's it's largely those that uh, have struggled to heat their homes are the poor. So I think it's something that's worthy of discussion. You know, I don't know the history of that, how long that 4% has been in place. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think, you know, that would be, you know, if we're successful in getting reelected, I think that's for sure that's something that we should take up, especially now that we're on a better financial footing. But when I recall that that 4%, if, um, if I'm not incorrect, represented about $400,000 for the county. So that's a equivalent to a 1% tax increase. So certainly in previous years when it has been mentioned, but there's never been a resolution, either under Democrat or Republican rule, um, I think nobody, because we were in such a dismal financial straits that no one actually brought the subject up or to mm -hmm. fruition. You know. So, but no, I think it's worth um, something to, to talk about for sure. Okay. I appreciate it. One of, you mentioned earlier uh, about the Department of Social Services and how large a chunk of the budget that is and what a, a large number of people who work for the county are actually working through that. Um, that is, uh, and you mentioned again about our, our poverty levels, and certainly uh, that is something that uh, rural counties all across New York State are really struggling with. You mentioned before about um, losing a lot of the high quality high-paying jobs, the, the good uh, benefit packages and all the rest back when 2008 and 2009, a lot of those jobs that were, have been replaced but with very low pay jobs that don't pay much in the way of benefits. So it's actually, people are, may still be working but they're truly the working poor because they're not making enough to make ends meet. So um, what do you think we can do to um, address some of those those poverty needs because lots of people are signing up for help with uh, medical problems because they can't afford to, to take care of it on their low wages. They, we know people need uh, help with food and with heat and all okay. the other things. How does the board struggle with that? How do, you, how do you solve those problems? Because it's a real conundrum, isn't it? Right. Well, it's a, it's a large problem. Um, the actual numbers for actual people on food stamps and requiring um, uh, temporary assistance are actually coming down. And I think that was in the Watertown Daily Times. I saw that article, yeah. So, so that's encouraging. Um, the other thing is really on the education piece of it is, you know, are we actually meeting the needs of the children that we're educating? Actually, are they being taught the skill set? Are they getting the right, are they, are they reading uh, proficiently at grade three? You know, are they being taught math skills? And uh, I think most of the encouragement, I think, at the high school level for the kids that are near the top or in the middle of the pack as, as far as their classroom average, average is pushing them towards uh, it's college. And I think that's fine, and that's been the push, but I think with uh, you know, the skill sets that some of the community colleges offer, a SUNY can, uh, plumbing, heating, these are all things. I mean, if you hire a plumber come to your house, you're gonna be getting charged, or an appliance person, you're gonna be getting $75 an hour plus the stop fee. So these can be high paying jobs and they don't necessarily have to have a little arts degree. Uh, but it's a challenge. 
here, um, New York State wants to be a progressive state. And Governor Cuomo himself has says to be a progressive state is expensive. So what happens is that a lot of these monies um, that are going towards that, that whole objective could actually be put towards infrastructure and, um, and skill sets for educating the young. And I think that would be you know, a very positive thing. We actually had uh, Tom Burns, who, as you know, is the okay. superintendent yeah. of St. Lawrence Louis, Louis Bosey's in on our first show this fall, talk about the need for the renovation package for the three yes. tech centers. And he talked about how many of the county uh, students are actually taking advantage of those programs yeah. and exactly the fields that you were just talking about, the career readiness thing. So so yeah. more, more work along that because those are uh, jobs that need to be filled and they're skills that you can learn. Through the, apprenticeship and other types of programs. The nice thing now, the change that I see, and this is since this is after that I was on the BOCES board, is that you see kids that are in the higher echelon, the highest 10% of their classroom average, that are actually using BOCES. Mm -hmm. And back when I was in school in the 70s, it was a real stigma to be in BOCES. It's not anymore. So a lot of people are taking care of <coughs> advantage of the health opportunities, the nursing, and that type of thing. Uh, so it's good that, and so it's it's more broad based, and I think that brings up the level of, of everything, particularly in, in the bosses. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with you. The other point I wanted to make was on this economic thing, is that we have a beautiful river, and we have four seasons of recreation here, either sporting, humming, hiking, traveling, skiing, biking, whatever, um, and we're seeing some of that being utilized here with the St. Lawrence River, uh, past my farm. You know, every summer now, I see a group of 20 to 30 to 50 bicyclists, and the majority of them are actually from Canada. So somebody has organized a bike a path, and you know, that's really low impact on our environment. They love going out, the farmers are friendly, and it's beautiful out there in the rural Doesn't environments. Doesn't wear and tear on the roads. It's not hard on the roads. <laughs> so, you know, so I, I think, you know, we have not taken advantage of that. And certainly what I see is young people in their 40s coming back because they want their kids to be in safe schools. And the schools up here are good. And actually, they have to, those parents have the skill set so they can um, operate from home, or they're actually in the, the academic environment at Clarkson, St. Lawrence, SUNY Potsdam, Canton, or the hospitals. That is about 40% of the jobs up here. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, you know, between the medical care and education, those are two of the huge employers yeah. in this county, yeah. right? No. And certainly the county is, is a, a large employer. And I yes. just have a couple of questions specific to that. Um, what are your thoughts? Are there, is it just right? Are there too few? Are there too many um, jobs in the county? And then thinking specifically, um, the caseworkers in the Department of Social Services, yeah. how is their load? Uh, mm -hmm. Does that need to be addressed? And finally, uh, the third part of the question is, how about the deputies? Okay. Are there uh, adequate numbers uh, for those in the county? What okay. are your thoughts on those? Well, the fact that we've added six jobs this year after the declines from back to 2011 means that we're at that point and actually that is something that Ruth Doyle, their county administrator, has been considering. Have we cut back too far through attrition in some departments or have we not done enough in others or where are we lead? Um, the beauty of the pol one of the policies that we put in place is a vacancy committee. So a vacancy committee is, well, I should say what happened before was any time there was a, a need for a job, the department head would come before us and argue for that position in front of all 15 of us. And we had never heard about it before, possibly. There wasn't, uh, the, you know, the discussion had not taken place. So now in vacancy committee, there's two legislators, Ruth Doyle, the county administrator, usually her assistant, and, a, and another person. So there's five individuals that are actually sitting at a table uh, where the department head comes in and talks about it. So you actually get to have a 15, 20 minute in-depth conversation. And uh, sometimes it's a 5-0 vote to fill that position. Uh, and sometimes it's a 3-2. And I've been on the losing side, I've been on the winning side. But usually, and so that's the beauty of that is, so then when the department head or that resolution comes before the board, the board is secure in the knowledge that actually two of the legislators actually had sat in and heard the argument. And it rotates through. It could be two Dems, it could be two Republicans, uh, it could be one of each. You know, and it's, it's a real bipartisan collaborative effort. 
And I think because of that, um, I think the actually average is we've hired, filled about, I think, 87% of those positions, and some are held for reconsideration. They asked the department head to go back and read, would you consider this? On the, uh, the caseload uh, for the Child Protective Services is tremendous. Uh, there's 24 individuals in that department right now, and they are swamped. There's no doubt about it. Um, actually, Chris Rodiz makes the case, if I'm on the vacancy committee, I'll err on the side of his judgment. I'll say, you know, if we have one too many or two too many, uh, if that saves a, a child from getting abused or neglected, I'm all for that. So that's, and the space that they are in, the 24, is really crowded. They're like right on top of each other. So that's something that we're going to address. Uh, you can be sure that Chris Rodiz, the social services commissioner, is going to make his case every time, every time. And, uh, and I like to hear it. We have great respect for Chris. But, uh, but your point is right on. We're at that stage where, um, where, need, where do we need to be? Where are we lacking? Are we, are we losing out on something? Or, um, or you know, have we shortfalls? Are people getting injured or something? Is everybody being neglected? So um, on the opioid uh, part of things, on the public health side of things, what we're seeing now is a trend towards the private sector, particularly the hospitals moving into those fields. Um, and I think what it is, it's all on these value-based payments, this new healthcare collaborative system, where before if you did a treatment or something, you would get this amount of money. Well now, if you did this treatment and that person ends up you know, six weeks later in the emergency room, you're not gonna get that money. Your agency, whether it's private, county, or whatever, you have to do an adequate job. So there's kind of a check and balance now. Before it's like, okay, we run X number of numbers through our clinic, we'll have this much revenue coming in. So now the way it's based on these uh, um, value-based things, you may not get reimbursed. So and say, let's say for example, we were offered $100 for a service. Six weeks later, if that individual is seeking mental or health or, or drug addiction problems at a hospital, <coughs> you're gonna you're gonna not get that money. So, so <coughs> Kevin, as we as we get ready to close up here, um, we would like to give you an opportunity to talk to the voters directly. They're about to head to the polls very shortly. What should someone know who's in your district um, about you, and you know, make the case for why someone should vote for you for another term? Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here and this opportunity. Our pleasure. Um, I have a lot of experience. I've been self-employed for 35 years on a dairy farm. It's not easy to do. Uh, 22 years at Major Waddington uh, was not a, a nice, easy ride. We did several things there. We fired um, fired a superintendent while I was there. We put a teacher in prison for uh, molesting a child. Uh, there were several incidents of uh, just really need for critical thinking. Uh, it was a real challenge. Both seats was pretty smooth. And I have lots of experience with negotiations, contracts, and litigation. Those are nonstop. Um, and, uh, you know, being a property taxpayer, I know the burden of taxes here in St. Lawrence County. So I believe myself to be a fair person. Um, I'm open minded. Uh, I read two newspapers every day. I've been getting the Wall Street Journal for 30 some years in the Watertown. And I read a lot of nonfiction about history and uh, what's going on in the world. To, to try to be informed. Obviously, you don't know it all. Don't pretend to know it all. Uh, but I'm open to listening. Uh, I belong to a group called uh, Meet Me in the Middle, which is a mixture of uh, conservatives and uh, and liberals. And uh, we get together the second Saturday of every month. And we've been doing this for about a year and a half. And we share ideas. Uh, we don't always meet in the middle. Uh, but it's great to know these people and to find out that each one of us doesn't have horns or a tail. So um, it's, it's fun getting to know each other, and I think that's what we need. We need more dialogue. Um, we're, we are going to have differences. Um, for me, I'm a fiscal conservative, and I think most of my liberal f friends think, well, if you cut the funding, you're actually hurting the, th hurting the project or the cause or whatever. And that's not always the case. And I'm not always right. Sometimes it is, it is valid. Um, so I think it's, it's a balance. And, uh, and I think that's uh, for the voters to uh, consider me. I think they should take that into account. I think that would be uh, valid for my position. All right. Thank you. Well, we appreciate you coming in today. Um, just a reminder to our voters that Election Day is November 6th. Uh, you, um, if for some reason you're not going to be in the county on the 6th, you can get an absentee ballot and vote 
uh, absentee, you will have that opportunity right up until the day of the election to do that. Um, these conversations are a production of North Country Matters, which is filmed here in the Potsdam Public Library's Fred W. Cleveland Computer Center. This show is a civic collaboration between the St. Lawrence County League of Women Voters, the American Association of University Women of St. Lawrence County, and the Potsdam Public Library. Until next time, remember, our North Country Matters. Kevin, thank you so much for coming in. We really appreciate the time.